Now we're going to move on to a very brief discussion on Doppler. This is a really neat application of ultrasound that carries many, many, many pitfalls. The good news is with basic point of care ultrasound, you rarely, if ever, really need Doppler ultrasound. But I'm going to give you a brief overview just so you're aware of some of the basics of Doppler and some of the common pitfalls associated with it. So what is Doppler ultrasound anyways? Well, we've talked about B-mode ultrasound already. Now, a lot of times the returning signals to the probe have the same frequency as the output that was generated. Now, the reason for that is most of our targets are stationary. If you consider a blood vessel, which normally is anechoic, it does have moving red blood cells in it, which actually do cause a small negligible echo. If you perform Doppler ultrasound, you can actually detect a change in the frequency of the sound, and that's what it's designed to do. But let's take a step back, and let's talk about the Doppler effect. What we have right here is a police car that is stationary. And what that means is no matter where you're standing, whether you're standing in front of the vehicle or behind the vehicle, the frequency of sound is going to be the same. Now, I've overlaid in this presentation the sound of a stationary siren. And this will now be the most annoying portion of this presentation. But I want you just to listen carefully and hear that even though the pitch is changing just due to the siren, you'll notice that overall the pitch is staying the same. There's no sudden increases or drops in the pitch other than the change in tone associated with, with the siren. So that should be enough for you. What I did want you to notice though is that no matter where you're standing, whether you're standing in front of the vehicle or behind the vehicle, the siren sounds the same. Now let's contrast that with a police car that is moving. Here we have an individual who is standing in front of the police car, and here we have an individual who's standing behind the police car. Now you notice because this police car is going to the right of your screen, that motion is actually compressing the frequency of that sound that is being produced. Therefore, it's gonna give a higher pitch sound for this person who is listening to the sound as it passes. Whereas this person, because the car is moving to screen right, the frequency is actually dropping because those sound waves are spreading apart due to the motion of the vehicle. So depending upon where you're standing, you're going to have a different pitch in the sound. So now what I've overlay is the sound of a siren from the perspective of someone who is first standing in front of the car and then behind the car. And what I want you to listen for is that change in pitch. Try to ignore the sound of the tires or the whooshing air. Just listen to the siren for a moment. So hopefully you notice that the frequency becomes quite high and the pitch therefore is very high until the vehicle then passes and then there's a steep drop off in pitch. And that's because the frequency suddenly drops off. And that's the Doppler effect. You guys have all been exposed to the Doppler effect in one way or another. You may not have realized what you are actually hearing. So again, this is the principle of Doppler ultrasound. Now, probably up until this lecture, you thought blue meant vein and red meant artery. Well, it's actually not the case. What the different colors really mean to ultrasound is the direction of blood flow. So what we have here is actually a pseudoaneurysm. I'm not sure which vessel this is coming off of. In any event, what you have here is blood initially moving towards the probe, and then it's swirling to go back out of the pseudoaneurysm, and it's turning blue. Even though this is the same blood flow within this vascular structure, it's changing colors because the direction of blood flow is changing. And you're getting a Doppler shift as those red blood cells are initially moving to the probe, and then those blood cells move away from the probe. And, the, and similar to our police car demonstration just a second ago, that changes the frequency shift of those moving targets. 
Now, normally there would be a scale overlaid here. I would say that traditionally, most of the time, red means towards the probe and blue means away from the probe. And again, when you're in color Doppler ultrasound, it's been cut out of this image. Normally, you'll see red facing up and blue facing down, and that's your, your color scale. Sometimes you may flip that color scale where blue is going to the probe and red is going away from the probe. So just always be mindful of that. Also, there will be a number assigned to that color. And that means that basically you can get some velocities associated with the tone of that color. Now, there's better ways to measure velocity, and we'll talk about that in a second. But an important take-home point is that the velocities can be estimated with color Doppler as well as the direction of blood flow can be estimated with color Doppler. Now to contrast that with power Doppler, which we have right here, you'll see that there is really no directional component assigned to this, so we can't tell the direction of blood flow. What we have here is a thrombosed graph in a subject who had a FEMPOP bypass, and there's a clot right here, and you can see that blood flow is coming up and then stopping, whereas right here we have the vein. And you see we do have some blood flow returning. So the direction of flow in this case is this way and then going back across. But we can't tell. There's no color assignment to indicate direction of flow with power Doppler. Additionally, power Doppler will not assign velocity to the flow. So you'll see here there's no numbers associated with this scale. So you can't get an estimate of velocity, whereas with color Doppler, normally you can get an estimate of velocity. Power Doppler is most useful in studying blood flow in organs where there is a very slow and low blood flow. So examples of that would be in the testicle, in the thyroid, the lymph node, and then again that's in normal organs. Then there's spectral Doppler. Spectral Doppler again is working off of the same principles as color Doppler and power Doppler. In this case you've placed a Doppler gate into a blood vessel and you're actually able to again detect that Doppler shift. This is an artery because we see this pulsatile flow whereas this is a vein and we know it's a vein because it has kind of a slow continuous undulating flow. Now in this case there is no assignment of a color scale. We can still tell direction of flow because above the baseline here is towards the probe whereas below the baseline is away from the probe. Additionally, we have a velocity scale applied to either side of your spectral Doppler images here, and therefore you can get an estimate of blood flow velocity. So you can see right here in this case, the blood flow is moving approximately 20 centimeters per second, and in this instance here, blood flow is kind of undulating around five centimeters per second. And this would be another indicator of arterial versus venous flow. But again, that also has pitfalls. So speaking of pitfalls, let's talk about that for a minute. Now, I only show you this equation to demonstrate the biggest pitfall that comes with Doppler ultrasound, in my humble opinion. I don't want you to necessarily memorize this, but just to review it, this is the velocity of blood flow. F is your received frequency. That's the frequency of sound as it returns to the probe. This is the speed of sound in your medium, 1540 meters per second. Two is a constant. This is your source frequency. Again, if you recall, it depends on what frequency probe you're using. If you're using a lower frequency probe, it's generally in the range of 3 to 5 megahertz, whereas a higher frequency probe is 5 to 10 megahertz. And this is going to be your angle of incidence and this is the big pitfall. Your velocity can be highly inaccurate depending upon the angle of incination, the angle of which you are scanning a target. That is going to greatly vary your velocity. So let's take a look at that. Now in this case, looking at this train, if you're standing on the train track and you're trying to measure the velocity of that train as it's coming to you, if you were using your Doppler to try to calculate that, this would be the optimal angle because you're looking straight down the pipe. There is no angle to account for. So you would have the most accurate velocity measurement looking straight down that pipe. 
Have you ever wondered why police cars actually sit out on the side of the road when they're trying to gauge your speed as you pass by? Well, this is why. It's the Doppler frequency. To be as accurate as humanly possible, they need to be as close to a zero angle to you as you drive by. Compare that to this angle here. Let's say this is approximately a 45 degree angle to the train that is passing by. And you can see that our velocity is measured to be slightly lower. That's because there is error introduced into your calculation because you're 45 degrees to the train. Even though the train in both cases is going the same speed. Well, the same applies to your blood vessel. The closer to zero degrees, i.e. looking straight down the barrel of your vessel, the more accurate you will be. Also note here at 90 degrees, there's almost no flow, even though there actually is flow in the blood vessel. If you're 90 degrees to that blood vessel, you're not going to get an accurate measurement of the velocity and flow within that blood vessel. So let's expand on that. Here we are 90 degrees to the direction of flow in our blood vessel. The cosine of 90 is zero. You plug that into your equation, you get a velocity of zero. So I just talked about that. If you're 90 degrees to your vessel, you're going to get evidence of really no flow, even though there may be normal flow. So what you have to do is rock the probe or heel toe the probe. You have to make sure that there's enough gel, the base of the probe, so contact remains within the skin. So a lot of times you're digging this end of the probe down into the skin, and you want to try to get that angle less than 60 degrees. And it's pretty widely accepted that if you can get your angle of insonation less than 60 degrees, then those measurements of velocity are within this acceptable margin of error. So with respect to spectral and color flow Doppler, angles are extremely important. You may be scanning a blood vessel that has completely normal flow, and your display on the ultrasound machine with Doppler, if you are at 90 degrees to that vessel, may show no flow. So hopefully you can see that can be extremely misleading. One of the nice things about power Doppler is that it's less dependent on angles. So you can use power Doppler a little bit better to assess flow when you're closer to a 90 degree angle. But understand that I said less dependent on angle. It's not not dependent on angles. So just bear that in mind. Say just be aware of these big pitfalls and use Doppler very sparingly and have someone actually train with you on Doppler at the bedside. Because I'm only giving you the tip of the iceberg, you can also mess up in your software settings with your gain, your pulse repetition frequency, which will give you errors in your readings. This concludes the third installment of Ultrasound Physics and Fundamentals. In the fourth and final installment, we're going to discuss artifacts. As always, please let me know if you have any questions at the email listed on your screen.